I want to welcome all of you to environmental geology. My name is Professor Rood, and I will be lecturing on each chapter throughout the semester. My intent is for you to have watched each video before coming to class in order to spend more time on class activities rather than lecture. I encourage you, however, to bring questions to class with regard to any concepts that are not completely understood in the lecture. So let's get started. This is Chapter 1, Planet and Population, an overview. This image here is showing the planets in our solar system, which are dated at 4.5 billion years. The Earth is unique in its chemical composition, surface water, an oxygen-rich environment. The interaction between geologic environments and the human population causes changes to our planet, and we will be discussing that in this chapter. Let me start by defining environmental geology. With this course, we're going to explore many and varied interactions between humans and the geologic environments. As humans and the activities that we do, we affect our Earth. And likewise, the Earth affects us as humans with things such as natural disaster, disasters, floods, and so forth, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions. There is only a finite amount of land left on our Earth for people to live. And as our population continues to grow, it is going to be more and more difficult for humans to live in a comfortable lifestyle. Let's take a look at the early uh, universe. The Big Bang Theory is the most widely accepted explanation of the origin of the universe. According to this theory, the universe was created about 12 to 14 billion years ago from an explosion that hurled matter out in all directions. After that, prior to the Big Bang, all the matter and energy would have been compressed into a dense hot volume, very small in size, and then it exploded and everything flung violently apart. From the material that was exploded during the Big Bang, stars formed. And then concentrations of mass were collected together due to gravity, and planets uh, uh, formed. So our solar system, the sun, and our nine planets, eight planets that circle, form from the rotating cloud of dust and gases. And most of the mass ended up in being in the sun. Uh, dust condensed from the gases remaining in the flattened cloud and clumped eventually into planets. And that took place and was finished by about 4.5 billion years ago. Let's look, look at this visually. Here we have the disk of gas and dust spinning around a proto-sun, a very young sun. Because of gravity, the small pieces of dust started to stick together. Eventually, these formed into small planets, planetesimals. And then planetesimals began to collide to form our planets that we have today in our solar system. What the composition of each planet is depends largely on how near or far from the sun the planet is. The inner planets to the sun are made, are considered rocky planets and consist of metallic iron, a few very high temperature minerals with little water or gas. Farther from the sun, the planets have more low temperature minerals present, some which actually have water in their crystal structures. And then still farther from the sun, Temperatures are so low that most of the material in the gas cloud condensed. So due to the proximity to the sun, or their distance from the sun, 
we have a series of planets with different compositions. Here is our inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Then we have the asteroid belt. And then our Jovian, or outer planets, are Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Please note that this scale is logarithmic because the distance is so great. So the planets in our solar system have different compositions and physical properties. In looking at this planet Mercury, it is rocky, iron-rich, dry, and has many craters on it. Jupiter, on the other hand, is very large, consists of gas, there's no solid surface, and it has dozens of moons of ice and rock. Nearer to the sun, farther from the sun, affects the composition of those planets. Let's compare the sizes of the jovial versus terrestrial planets. The first thing to note is this scale here is equivalent to 5,000 kilometers. So here is our terrestrial or inner planets. And you can see what their approximate dimensions are. Now going down to our Jovian planets, uh, this scale here, 50,000 kilometers, not 5,000. So you can see that these are giant in size compared to our inner planets. Here's some basic planetary data listed in this table 1.1. You can see the densities of the inner planets are greater than those of the outer planets. Heavier materials stay closer to the sun. Lighter material was blown away. We have temperatures listed and distance from the sun. So looking at the early Earth, it was a barren world with a lot of craters. There were no oceans. There wasn't an atmosphere. The planet's heat came from collisions by dust particles and meteorites. Also, heat was released from radioactive decay of elements. Eventually, these heat sources combined and the Earth's internal temperature got high enough that it was likely completely melted, uh, maybe not all at once, but mostly molten at various times early in Earth's formation. So as Earth cooled, what happened was the heavier, more dense elements sank toward the middle of the Earth, and the lighter, low-density minerals uh, crystallized and floated out toward the surface. What ended up was a differentiated Earth and we are looking at the core, mantle, and crust. These are called compositional layers because they vary in their chemistry. The core is dense and hot. The inner core is solid. The outer is liquid. Composition is nickel and iron. The mantle surrounds the core. It is composed of ultramafic and mafic rocks, rich in iron, magnesium, and some silicon and oxygen. The crust is chemically different from the core and mantle, and we can define two different types of crust, ocean crust and continental crust, and their composition varies as well. Let's take a look at the Earth's crust, two different types, continental versus oceanic. Continental is more of a granitic, a granite-like composition. Ocean crust is a basalt. We'll talk more about these types of igneous rocks later. So the crust is a very, very thin layer. The mantle is a significant portion of our Earth, consisting of iron and or magnesium rich silicate minerals. And then the core, the outer core, is liquid. Iron and nickel is its composition. The inner core is solid. Iron and nickel is its composition as well. Here's a visual of ocean crust versus continental crust. Note continental crust is much thicker than oceanic crust. I'm going to finish up chapter one, video one, with this last figure here, table 1.2. It shows the whole earth 
composition according to element. So iron, if you look at the whole earth, is the most abundant element by weight, followed by oxygen. If, however, you look at just the crust, the most abundant element is oxygen followed by silicon, and this is a weight percent. I'm going to stop now for this first video of Chapter 1, and we will continue in Video 2.